Okay, everybody, welcome. Pleasure to have you. It's a pleasure to welcome for the first time, we always make a, a Shekhiano, uh, Dr. Rachel Cooperman, who is actually visiting from Israel, uh, in uh, California for Yontif, who just received her PhD in Jewish art history at Barling University on Dutch Jews of the early modern period. She is uh, as an MA in contemporary art history from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, uh, BA at Yeshiva University at Stern. I assume at Stern you didn't major in art. Is that correct? I did. But uh, I don't know. I, I did major I don't in art there, yeah. But I'm surprised that they actually have an art major in Stern. Okay. Yeah, you, it's, yeah. It's, it's a really well-run department. Yeah, oh, there's an art okay. history department and an art department. Um, I did both. It was great. Okay, great. Okay, so I think uh, a little bit, a little bit, bit different, but I am very interesting. Uh, the history, as you see, the evolving aesthetics of the state of play. Bakasha, Rachel. Sure. Um, it's really nice to be here today. Um, thank you, Rabbi Kalman, for including me. Um, thank you to Gabe Goldstein for connecting us. Um, and really, thank you for letting me be a part of this because. It's unusual, I think, for me, at least in my Pesach preparation, for that to include something that's not scrubbing and dusting and being able to do something that is um, um, reflective, historically engaged in the ceremony and um, a thought piece. And it's obviously, it's my career, it's what I do all the time, but specifically being able to time it with Pesach for this um, program that you're doing, this Pesach prep. Um, it's just really a, a nice experience for me and, and different from my regular Pesach prep of cleaning. So thank you. Um, and with that, I'll get started just talking about um, this class. Um, I just want to make sure I'm keeping a good eye on time. We're going until 315? 315. Yes. Okay. Yes, three fifteen. Okay, no, I'll leave some time for the question. Bit, yeah, yeah, yeah. Three fifteen, but we don't have a gun to, you know. <laughs> okay. wow. Well, I want to make sure I have time for questions because I'm used to, um, I'm used to teaching with a class where it's very interactive, where because it's art and objects, what you see in front of you as the viewers is very important to this conversation. So it's kind of going to be me speaking into the ether of what do we see here, and then answering it immediately. Um, when I usually, it's always enlightening to hear the students immediately and the, the listeners immediately responding to what they see, because often I miss things. And often, just as a viewer with your own experience and your own background, you're going to see things um, differently. So you can, it's okay if you want to have people hear comment, and then, you know, that's up to you. I, I don't object that. That's fine. People do that okay. anyway. But, uh, so that's an, an open invitation, I guess, to everyone. Um, and we'll see just in terms of technology how that works. So if I answer my own questions, um, we could go from there. Feel free to include your own um, observations too. So we're looking at the Seder plate. That is the topic. And what we're looking at is just to contextualize the Seder plate is this object that sits in the center of our ceremony of the Seder, of our yearly experience retelling the story of the Exodus, reliving um, the Passover story. And we do this very often in an intergenerational setting, hopefully. And if not, we do it with friends. And this object is not sacred, but it sits in the center of a sacred conversation where text is being shared and stories are being shared and memories are being shared. And in that sense, the objects are very personal. And I, I'm starting off, the, the class really takes two perspectives. First, we're going to look at Seder plates today. And these are the Seder plates we have in our homes. And I really hope you're able to recognize ones that are part of your experience. There are styles that you might think are like totally obvious and they're what you have in your family. And I'm sorry, I didn't include them. I know it's true for my family. In my family, um, for forever, we have this Lennox white Seder plate, and I didn't include it in this talk. So if you don't see yours, 
your your Seder plate is just as valid and just as beautiful and just as part of this tradition, um, let me know. Um, and it fits into the conversation we're having. So the first part is going to be looking at Seder plates of today and understanding their construction, their design, meanings embedded in the object. And then we're gonna take a different look and we're gonna look at historical Seder plates and how those have changed over time to get us to the Seder plates that we have today. And what we're going to see is it's not linear, is that there's all these different styles and shapes and uses and functions and, um, and that's part of the beauty of the Seder. It's a lived experience. It'll look different in different places. Every year, it's the same ceremony with different meanings and intentions. So I'm going to start first with the way that um, we talk about Judaic and my family. And whenever we go shopping for Judaica, it's always this question of, okay, what's your style? Contemporary or classic? So we're going to break that down. Looking at styles today. Tell me if you could see the slides in front of you. Is it popping up? Is it working? Great. So I just collected a series of contemporary Seder plates that fit specifically this style that we call modern. And what makes it modern? If you would see these, I hope you would categorize it the same way. Um, if you don't, I would love to hear why, and we'll get back to that at the end. But really, I categorize it as modern with the sense of modern industrial revolution. We have machine-made clean lines. We have metalwork. We have uh, fonts that have been printed. Um, and we have a sense of form and function, which means that there is a construction that is supposed to be utilitarian as well as beautiful. And here we have these contemporary designs and they range from silver to aluminum, to clay, to acrylic. Um, they range from um, artists in Israel to Kate Spade, who is a, a fashion icon in America. They range from um, floral decorative motifs to strict geometrical forms. Um, there's text and there's examples that have less text. So those are the modern examples. The other examples that we see are what I call, let's see, is the slide going to cooperate with us? I call it contemporary retro, which means they're made today, but there's something about it that is referencing something older. So I made a little collection here. And what do I mean by that? And we'll go in now for the next, I guess, 10 minutes, 15 minutes to really break down what are we seeing that the artists today are using to reference older styles and older Judaica. So the first example is right in front of you. It's from Hatzorfim, which I live in Israel. So this is a, a silver uh, Judaica factory. Um, where pieces are made in the multiples. It's it's beautiful silver craft, It's but it's done with an industrial design. And we have these fine details on it. And I want to zoom in on those details here. Let's see. We're going to pop it up a little bit. Um, this is the part where I would say, oh, and what do you see? But since I see a lot of you are muted, I'll just answer. What we see here are small, we could call them, finials or roundels. And if we look closer, and if you're familiar with uh, Jewish ritual culture, you know that this is a Torah crown. And we see it, that this is a shape of a Torah crown that has deep, deep roots in Ashkenazi Jewish heritage. From the really Polish um, heritage, we do see it in Germany, but we see it a lot more um, in the Polish heritage, this specific style of a coronation crown is used for the Torah. I say coronation crown because um, in practice, a crown like this, not on a Torah, but used for regal purposes, would usually have fabric on it. Um, 
And in our synagogue environments, we see that they don't. We see that they are of um, of um, pure metals of silver, and often they are decorated with precious and semi-precious stones. Sometimes um, today we'll see the inclusion of fabrics, but for the most part, we don't. So he, coming back to the Seder plate, we have these little details of Torahs, references to Torahs, to Jewish Torahs, meaning Jewish crowns that are used for Torahs. This isn't a reference to Polish royalty and German royalty. This is a reference to Torahs, to Jewish ceremonial objects. And it's a reference that goes back several hundred years. And later we're gonna see other Torah crowns, which makes it very clear that this artist is referencing an another time, generations back of Torah scrolls, Torah crowns, as opposed to different Torah crowns that we would see today. Okay, next, coming back to the contemporary retro. This, we just looked at ceremonial objects. Now we're just going to look at style and the styles that the artists are choosing. And here in this Seder plate, it's very, very subtle. It's a technique that's called repoussé, which is a metalworking technique where a surface of a metal is manipulated by an artist in the front and the back to create a very unique texture. And this specific texture has a deep historical reference. I'm gonna zoom in and I hope the zoom in is clear for you. I hope it's crystal clear for you. And it's the, um, it's a straw woven basket and it's metal. So it's obviously not a straw woven basket, but it's a artistic technique that's kind of cheeky of like, look what I could do with a hard, uh, material, I can make it look like a soft, pliable um, medium. And this has almost a straight connection to British decorative art, specifically porcelain um, bowls that are made to look like baskets. And we see this in the 18th century. We It's kind of just immediately associated with British um, decorative arts and all of these that you see on your screens in front of you are not woven. It's porcelain. It's ceramics that are made to look pliable, that are made to look soft. That is really an expression of the artist showing off their skill. And this isn't a Jewish style. This is a British decorative style. And yet we see the artist in our contemporary retro collection um, is looking back at history and seeing what are some, what are ways that this artist can manipulate this repoussé technique um, to give it some historical backing to also show their skill. Um, so I just think that's a nice example of a contemporary retro that's stepping just outside um, the Jewish visual vocabulary. We have a few more. Okay, another one. And this is taking a very different direction. In these two, again, from Hatzor Fim, um, which is in Israel, immediately we see this gold and white, gold and silver interchange. And that is an aesthetic that is very closely related to Russian aesthetics going back to the Baroque period. Here we see um, the ceiling of the Hermitage in the 1730s, but it exists until today um, in Russia, this specific gold and white, gold and silver interplay, um, where the designs weave in and out of each other. Of course, there are other examples of mixed metals that we see throughout visual culture, but these are specific Baroque designs that are, when used with this color technique, is a reference to Russian architecture. Let's move on. Um, we have other examples of architecture here in this silver um, um, silver and gold and another metal alloy Seder plate. We have um, another type of architectural reference. And depending on where you are in the world, it'll have different names. And um, I, from New York, know this as the Federalist style or the neo-colonial style the neoclassical style. And here we have a synagogue, um, one, of the, the old, one of the oldest Jewish communities, continual Jewish communities in America. Their shul in 1890s was designed 
with this aesthetic. This aesthetic is associated in America with um, the foundation of the country. Um, it is called neoclassical, which means it's a Greek revival. And in America, we associate it with it being American, but really it's an Italianate design. It's a Baroque design. Um, it's not like the Russian example we just saw, where it has different types of ornate details, but it's a uh, Italian design. And we also see it used um, in Judaica. This neoclassical design is really um, um, appreciated and used by the Jewish community to really formulate their own uh, visual vocabulary. And they're using it here, we see in um, a shar, in the entryway to Judaica. And, and you could see this, this is just one example, um, kind of like you open up an art scroll, you'll see the same design there. So in this example of a Seder plate, the artist is using those architectural references. And what's interesting, and you can't really see it here, but if you zoom in, there's also eagles. So the reference to the American federal style is interesting. I'm not really sure what the artist is saying with that, but it is definitely looking back at a classic style. No, what's next? Um, I guess let's do one more looking back. Let's do one more looking back. Um, and here we have, um, moving a little bit further in history, we have Rococo styling. And Rococo styling is different from um, what we've seen before in that there is a lot of attention to ornate detail. And I think for the most part, when we think collectively of uh, classical Judaica, this really comes to mind. We see these um, this interlace, this um, decorative, floral motifs, geometric motifs. We see often these little footings that hold up the object that are also decorative. And it's a really rich celebratory way to demonstrate your ceremonial objects. Um, and that's really what the Rococo style was in the 18th century. And it's, it's used until today as a very um, ornate celebration of whatever object you're showing. So here I gave you an example of how it's used in secular society, but it's used in Jewish culture as well. Here is a, a Torah shield where we see this very elaborate um, interchange of vegetal and floral and really the architecture doesn't quite make sense. It's kind of fantastical um, and really joyful. That's really kind of the dominant, I guess, aesthetic that comes through with the Rococo. So taking a look back, we just looked at examples that we have today. Um, these are the contemporary retro. And if we put it right next to the contemporary modern, um, again, we really see that the contemporary retro have a lot of detail going on. And the contemporary modern have, again, these clean lines. Um, there are some exceptions. Let's see, is that going to pop out? No, it's not. There we go. Where even in the contemporary modern, and we call this one that I just um, zoomed in on modern because of um, the hammered metal look, which is um, an industrial aesthetic with the way the fonts are used. Um, that is a, a modern print aesthetic but we see on the very, very bottom, it has those Rococo legs that we talked about. So, you know, it doesn't have to be a pure design at our own Seder tables. Um, there's a little modern, there's a little contemporary mixed in. And um, as we transition out of this topic and looking at our Seder place at our own Seder tables, um, the lovely takeaway that I have with this, and I hope you share it with me, is that we see that artists are looking back on history and they're picking out what's beautiful. And our Seder is a moment of looking back at history, whether it's an intergenerational table or not, but it is all about looking back to generations past, the continuity of the Seder experience and pulling through to the present, these beautiful moments. And this is what the artists are doing with these Seder plates. Um, even if it's modern, they're doing it. 
And even in these, um, and especially in these classic examples, we see that they're kind of mixing the, the most beautiful examples that they could find. I heard someone knocking, okay. So now that we talked about our Seder plates today, kind of transitioning back to what does it mean, this intergenerational aspect? What did Seder plates used to look like? You know, if if you are having a Seder experience and you're remembering a Seder experience you grew up with, how far back does this go and what did those Seders look like? So a late example I came up with uh, is pre-expulsion Spain, Sephardic. We haven't actually looked at a difference between Sephardic and Ashkenazi Seder plates yet. Um, but this is a lovely example of pre-expulsion Spain. And this example, what we're going to look at, and this is where we're going to kind of go back in history and come back to today and trace different themes. So we're going to look at design. We're going to look at material. We're going to look at texts that are used. We are going to look at um, the different kinds of images that are used. So here we have... Um, the use of clay or sometimes porcelain plates with decorative elements that aren't really specific to be Passover. There's nothing on this that is delineating how the plate should be used like we're used to with the different sections. There's no in instructions. But what we do see in the middle, could anyone read that? I don't know. It's funny because it, these are all circles. So whenever there's text, like I have to go around and, and look at it, but it's hard to do. It says uh, Pesach, Matzah, Maror, Seder. And in this way, we know that this plate, which may have been purchased as just a regular plate, was assigned for the Seder experience exclusively. And we see that as late as the 1480s, that in the 1480s, families were gathered around for the Seder experience with a central plate. And we're going to jump ahead a little bit and we're going to move more to the Ashkenazi community for a moment. Here we see something similar. We see again a plate that doesn't have any delineated sections, not place put on top, not um, carved in bowls to place things. And we see texts. So in addition to clay or porcelain, there's other materials that are used, specifically metal. And this is an example of pewter, which in the 18th century is an important metal. It's a compound metal um, that was relatively new at the time. So it's modern and exciting. Um, and it's very pliable. So it's fashionable, it's way cheaper than silver, and it's easy for an artist to manipulate it in a way that's um, more effective than um, other metals. So here, if we kind of zoom in or inch your head forward, uh, we see a lot of text going on, moving from the outside to the inside. The outer layer, the first text we encounter, is the Halach Ma'anya text, which when you open up your Haggadah is kind of, is the introductory text to the experience. So it's kind of lovely that the artist is familiar with the Haggadah and Seder experience and is inviting you literally to the plate with this prayer that's an invitation, with this text that is inviting you to join them. So as you move in, the next layer, let's, can I, let me see, I think I do have a zoom in of it. We'll get to that. That's not exactly the zoom in I wanted. The next layer is uh, the different steps of the Seder. Kadesh or Chatz Karpas, Chatz, the different stations that bring you throughout the Seder experience. And then there's a really nice um, dedication text that goes around, um, which pretty much indicates that this may have been a wedding gift and says the names of the groom, of the man and the woman who this belonged to them. Um, and then we move into the inner circle where we have our images. And we didn't see this before in the earlier example. The early example was geometric design. And here in this um, 
Ashkenazi example, we see figures. And who are the figures that are seen? They're actually labeled for us, so we don't have to guess. They're not just characters on a plate. These are intentional characters for the Seder experience. So we have Moshe. We have Paro. We have a whole variety of characters from the Exodus story. And in addition to that, let's see, can we go, maybe let's just go through all of them. Okay, on the very top right, so like one o'clock, we have Paro, and I'm going clockwise. Tell me if you're with me, are, are you able to follow this? There's Paro, that's like one o'clock. Then moving just down, we have Aaron HaKohen, and that's a very specific style that's taken actually from um, some Christian art that Aaron, who's holding the incense burner, um, we, we'll get, to, maybe let's skip that for now. And then we're jumping. Here we have, could anyone read that? It's the Chacham. We have the Chacham brother. And as we go around, we have, oh, who is that? I can't see. I lost my note on that. I'm, I, I have to turn my whole computer around. I'm not sure. I'm assuming it's one of the brothers for now. I'm pretty sure it is. Moving over, we have Miriam. And then next to that, we have the Sheino Yu Daily Show. Oh, so I guess that must be the Tom or the... I can't read it. I don't know if it's my glasses. Anyway, I'm not sure exactly yeah. what that character is. So then, is anyone able to read that? I think it says Tom as the third word. The it Tom is the Tom. third word. Okay. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, so we have the brothers represented. We have Miriam represented. We have Moshe, Paro, Aaron, the main cast of characters for our Seder experience, not only for the Exodus story, but really referencing the Haggadah. Um, which places this as a uniquely, obviously a Jewish object, but an experiential object. It's not just a plate dedicated to the Exodus story. This is entrenched in the Haggadah experience because the four sons are not part of the Exodus story. They're part of the Passover experience. And in the very middle, we have the Korban Pesach, who is actually not present at our Seder, um, but it is a reference to um, satyrs of past. And it's all placed in this beautiful sundial in the middle. Okay, so this is where we got from, let's say, 1480s to 1770s. So a, a lot of time has passed, and we've seen some significant changes in the style. It's still a plate, and there's decoration on it. There's text on it. We see there's geometric decoration, and we also see there's people. And now we're going to jump ahead another chunk of time to the 1920s. And what are the changes we see here? And this is where I want to spend some time now. Um, if this, I would love it if you could share or shout out, you're welcome to, things that you see that are the same and things that you see that are different. Um, I could pause for, I'll pause for a few seconds if you want to chime in with it. Um, and keep taking a look. I'm going to talk about some things and maybe it'll bring some things up for you. So please, if you, as I go on and talk about the differences, please share your own observations. So this is set, uh, 1924. And here it is pretty much the same size. Um, we have a metal surface. We have texts, we have figures, we have geometric designs um, that are used for a Seder plate. Now, this Seder plate is made with steel, not pewter. But guess what? Steel was a new metal alloy at its time in the 1920s. So both of these are with modern, bright, shiny technology of new metals. And um, in that sense, even though they're technically different metals, they're very similar in terms of their function and in the artist's choice. Um, what else do we see? We see that um, the decorations are both geometric and figural, but the style is very different. The style that we saw earlier is freehand, craft art, um, you could even say um, um, kind of a naive hand um, or non-practiced hand. And here you see 
really a reflection of a printing process. These clean lines, we're starting to get into the modern era. So an appreciation for these clean lines that we talked about earlier with uh, modern styling. Um, they're decorated with this print process that really results in finer detail, cleaner lines. And the technique that's used creates a black ink that's darkened or burnished um, that allows for the design elements to really be visible as they contrast the black from the metallic. Um, and I think most importantly, the designs are, are moved from a printed, from a freehand to a printed. And that's a big jump that we're seeing. But beyond that, there really aren't so many differences because let's look at who is being represented on this Seder plate. Let's see how close can we move into this. Let's see. Okay, we're gonna zoom in a little bit. We have Moses on the left. We have David. We have our wise son. We have our wicked son. We have our simple son. And we have the son who, who cannot answer. Uh, so the She'en Oli Daily Shoal. But what is different about the way that these figures are portrayed? Let's start with Moses. Let's see. Will my digital animation work? Here we go. The artist here is using Michelangelo's Moses. Sands the crown, the horns, because he's this artist is not using the horns. But this is a rendering of Michelangelo's Moses. This artist who is designing this Seder plate is fully aware of Western art history. And they know that in Rome, Michelangelo, this is before the internet, Michelangelo made a Moses and they know what that Michelangelo looks like, or they are educated enough in the world of art, church art, because this isn't a church, to go to a library and sketch it out. So this is our Moses that we have on our Seder plate. Oh, that's cute. I did a little. Um, okay, next, David. This is Bernini's David. Again, Renaissance. The, you could see the images are kind of reversed, um, which we could talk about in a second about. That has a, a much deeper reference to um early 20th century printing and how images and art history and slides were communicated when you don't have the internet. It's a lot of negatives and reverses. So very often when we see images being shared and repeated, they're reversed. So here we have Bernini from Rome, Renaissance Rome. His semi-nude David is being repeated here. And uh, again, this artist is engaged and aware of um, art history in a way that's very different from our artist earlier. So we have these plates that um, span like 150 years and there are changes that are made. Um, there's a change in style preference and material and production. And really, even with all of these changes, the object kind of remains the same. It's metal with black lines the same size, similar figures, similar texts. And this is 1924. And now we're going to have like a oh, moment. We're going to skip ahead six years. And then we have something. Nope, that's not what I meant. This. Six years later, we have this. And this is a work by the artist Ludwig Walpart. This is a Seder plate that was so successful that it was exhibited in the Palestine Pavilion at the Chicago World's Fair in 1938. So less than 10 years later, it was celebrated on an international scale. Um, in the 1930s, um, this is something that was outside of the visual vocabulary of the Jewish experience. So looking at Ludwig Walpert, this gentleman, um, we'll talk about him in a moment, but he's making this three-tiered Seder plate um, that displays new art. It just, it symbolizes a modernized art 
a modernized Jew, an international design. Uh, the Bauhaus is an important reference. We're going to get to that in a minute. The Bauhaus as an art school and as an art movement. Um, and its placement in the World's Fair marks it as an achievement in Jewish craftsmanship, design, technique. That was a celebrated shift for the future of Jewish ritual aesthetics. Um, and in 1938, Ludwig Walpert's creation was representing this shift and can i just say i i just did notice though in the previous one um even though the the artistic the figures were classical this one yeah yeah the rim strikes me as somewhat art deco inspired yeah yeah great eye which absolutely is like a modern thing yeah great eye yeah um and I'd love it. So thank you for that. I hadn't contextualized it as Art Deco, but you're absolutely right. And it's part of this language where we're seeing kind of a callback to things that are older and familiar to what is the contemporary aesthetic until we kind of just have like this schism in, in, in all of it. So really, thank you for that. Yes, Art Deco for sure, for sure. Um. So with this massive schism, and we could talk about the, the Seder plate in a moment, I want to talk a little bit about Ludwig Walpert, the, the artist himself. Because um, in the world of Jewish ritual art, this is a significant change. He was born in 1900s um, to a traditionally Jewish family in the suburbs of Heidelberg, Germany. Um, and he be begins his um, professional trajectory at the age of 16 as a sculptor. And he's at the School of Arts and Crafts in Frankfurt in 1916. So he's 16 years old. Um, he takes a short leave to apprentice. Um, and he then becomes uh, specialized in metalwork. And in 1920s, um, he returns to school with a silversmithing teacher that include teachers who trained in the Bauhaus. And I mentioned that earlier, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means that his teachers were coming from this educational background. Um, his two teachers specifically were masters in metal and their names were Christian Dell and Leo Harvitz. And it was under their guidance that Walpert creates modern Jewish ceremonial art. And that's when it starts. So talking just about the Bauhaus, so we understand where these artists are coming from and what it is that they're doing. The aim of the Bauhaus as a, it really, we understand today as an artistic movement, but it was really a utilitarian movement. It was to combine the mechanical nature of production and the humanist production of art in one. It was seen as kind of both utopian and also nihilistic of everything that happened before, where we are modern, we could do better. Let's optimize efficiency and the human experience and beauty and what that could mean without being tied to these previous ideas of other people defining what beauty is for us. Um, in that sense, the nihilistic part <laughs> came with um, the Bauhaus general, I would call it like a disenchantment with language um, and nationalism. Um, and the Bauhaus as a movement had a preference for conceptual art that distilled ideas into formal qualities. And that's kind of where we see the functionality of the Seder plate really being influenced. Um, and it creates a whole new visual language. And um, this isn't important. Wassily Kandinsky was part of that movement. Um, but what we see is, is that um, this was a huge influence for um, Ludwig Walport, this artist. But in 1933, he, his wife, and his daughter, Chava, who I interviewed as part of this research, she she's passed, but it was lovely talking to her. Um, they moved to then Palestine for his appointment as the professor of metal crafts at the Batsal Art School of Crafts in Jerusalem. Now, the Bauhaus is an important artistic movement, and the Batsal School is an important artistic movement. The Batsal School exists today. Um, I don't know if some of you are familiar with it as it is today and as it is historically and um, what its mission statement is. So I'll just talk about it for a moment. Um, 
it was there that he taught contemporary design and silversmithing um, in the framework of Jewish ceremonial art. He was charged with, you are a teacher of metal crafts, but in the language, in this art school, we are making Jewish ceremonial art. And in this sense, we've already seen how he's told this, the artist thinking about that Seder plate we saw is including the idea of form and utilitarianism, but is really rejecting obviously nationalism. Um, and we also see that he will later reject the idea of language because he incorporates Hebrew in a very interesting way. Um, the Batalo Art School founded in 1906 in Jerusalem by Boris Schatz. Um, it, it exemplifies a political and national agenda at its time. Um, and I actually have um, a quote from Walpert. I'll read it to you because he'll say better than me. He says, in my case, and this is talking about his his uh, move from the Bauhaus aesthetic and where he's breaking and taking on the Batsalo um, interest. He says, in my case, and this is very institutionally engaged, in my case, Jewish art expression must be free. It cannot be bound by gullet. Israel has given me that freedom. So he is reflecting this freedom of the Bauhaus that breaks ties with the past, but he's also very engaged in a Jewish experience. What the Bauhaus detested in nationalism and language, Walpert embraces that at Batsala. Um, this is a quote about Batsala. I'm just going to skip past it for the sake of time. And this is um, just a really nice image, if anyone's not familiar with Batsala, um, of what it looked like in its early years. And it was bringing in artists, Jews from um, around the world, largely from um, Europe, training them in art, but in a uniquely Israeli experience. So here you see, it's probably problematic, you see um, a woman uh, as the model in the center. You also could see right next to her, there's a woman artist in the school, which wasn't always common in these art schools, that women were invited in to be the artist as well. So that's, this is where he is teaching. Um, until um, in 1957, Walpert accepts a position. Um, his title is first, first master craftsman in residence at the Toby Pasha Workshop, which is in the Jewish Museum in New York City. The Toby Pasha Workshop does not exist today. I wish it did because it was an amazing um, contribution to uh, Jewish art where it really created artists in residence and gave them workshop and space to continue that Bitsalo, um drive for what is Jewish ceremonial art demand? What does it need? How do we use it and rethink about it in this post-war era? And in this lovely picture, you could actually see that Seder plate that we talked about just before. And um, in it are two other artists that came with him from the Batsalo Institute. Um, this, this image I took from... Um, the, there's a Walpert archive at the Yeshiva University Museum um, where they have been very generous with uh, letting me use their their archives. And um, the Jewish Museum also has a partial archive as well. Um, so here, this is his Seder plate. And he goes on to many other aspects of Jewish ceremonial art. Um, it's not just the Seder plate. This doesn't have words. So I just want to point out, because we talked about Torah scroll, so I'm going to take a, a 35 second tangent. This is his Torah scroll, Torah crown, I mean. So very different than what we saw before. And we see he's including text. So, you know, this is a Torah crown that we may have seen previously. And in 50 short years, he revolutionizes that. Um, this was from his archive. I'm going to skip ahead to that to what's next. Um, and here we come back to um, the Seder plates that we see today, where we had looked at these before and we called them retro. But now that we understand the industrial design and the form and the function of Walpert, we kind of might call these modern. They obviously have this old reference back 
But this design is modern in the sense that it is engaged with industrialism. It is engaged with uh, um, rethinking the ceremonial experience, um, not in a way that changes the ceremony, but just to approach it differently. Um, and what I love about this design is it is so ubiquitous. Um, when my parents, when I first started doing this research, uh, we're from New York and in New York, there's just like all these like um, discount stores and some of them sell Judaica also. So my dad got so excited because in Amazing Savings, he found a Walpart style um, um, Seder plate. So he had to get it and show it to me. <laughs> But um, again, this this brings back that question of what's contemporary, what's modern, what's informing what. Um, yeah, I'm going to jump ahead. And we talked about what is modern. And in these examples, we talked about these as examples as modern. But if we're looking at where the Seder plate came from in the 1400s, these kind of look a lot more like the 1400 ones than the other ones that we had seen. So there's kind of this, you know, historical push and pull in design and in aesthetics. And um, I think that's kind of the, for me, just to be emotional about it, that's kind of the magic of the Seder experience where there is this historical push and pull between you as an individual with your Haggadah at your Seder and yourself the year before and the year before where you were reading the exact same texts, but what was on your mind then? It's the same experience, but you're approaching it differently every year. And more than that, what was it like when you were a child and who was leading that Seder and what was on their mind and et cetera, et cetera. And the concept that Jewish ritual objects are a lived experience because Judaism is a lived faith that is continual generation after generation. And that is so prevalent in the Passover experience um, that it's with that, that I really um, see the beauty in our Seder plates. And it doesn't matter what it looks like because we will find some historical reference there. I bet whether it's something that you've seen here that you have exactly, or something that you don't have um, that, I, I skipped yours and I'm sorry if I, I skipped something that, that you have that um, might have added something different. Um, so yeah, I wanted to also, these were ones that we saw before in different categories of modern. We're talking about how they're retro and really these actually include kind of a little bit of both in a charming way where um, there's the flat surface, but there's the receptacles. There's the old motifs, but there's the machine-like precision. There is um, the hard metalware. Um, in some of them, there's an engraved Hebrew text, and in some of them, it's a machine-printed typography. Um, so that's just another example. And from there, um, I guess we could finish. Um, I'd love to hear if any of you have questions or comments. Oh, I skipped ahead. This was um, just a, a reflection, not related to the Seder plate, um, but of uh, the idea of um, resilience, uh, the Jewish resilience through the slavery experience in Egypt. And um, as an art historian, um, those lessons come about in, in so many contexts. So just to jump ahead, and I'm sorry, um, this is a, a very your sound is not clear. I don't know what happened there for a minute. I'm sorry. I know I lost you. Could you hear me? The sound went off. I can hear you. You can hear? Can hear you. You're fine. Okay. Um Probably Jay lost his sound and everybody else. Oh, we, I, we I imagine he'll be last, back. The, the last minute or so, it was very fuzzy and unclear. Oh, we, okay. The issue is. Did, is that my internet? Should I try to reconnect it? No, you were fine. I'm okay. Okay. Uh -huh. The um, only issue was with you. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> 
this is this is the tragedy of Zoom. <laughs> There's a lot of blessings in Zoom, and that's the tragedy of Zoom. Um, but yeah, totally unrelated to Pesach and the Seder plate. Um, but um, it's I think it's been a hard year for a lot of us, and this is not a Jewish example at all. Um, but as an art historian, seeing um, visual references and self-expression repeated in lots of places, this over here is again, totally tangential to the Seder plate. This is, um, it's called Raft of the Medusa. Um, it was uh, painted in 1818. It is massive. It has a very tragic story. There was um, a ship on the coast of Senegal that was carrying um, passengers and slaves and became capsized. It was a very tragic story and it raised a lot of awareness for um, abolitionist causes. Um, and uh, we see that celebrated in this where... Um, Eventually, after terrible tragedy, very few survivors and a lot of horror, um, they were saved. And here you see that one of the African slaves is the champion of this. And um, there's just like a pop cultural moment of Jay-Z, who's a contemporary Black rapper. This picture has to do with French colonialism, having nothing to do with that. But standing in front of this and his lyric is, um, I can't believe we made it. Look where we came from. And just coming back to the Pesach experience um, during a hard year, thinking of um, really Am Yisrael Chai. We've been through really hard things and we come through and we need to look back and feel those hard moments, especially, I, I don't know where all of you are in the world, but I, I know everyone's been touched by this year. Um, and to see that and and, and I hope that everyone has the Seder experience that it invites them to look back and also to feel hope for um, all the wonderful things to come in the Jewish experience this coming year. And with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, and if anyone has any questions or observations, especially ones that I missed, I would really um, love to hear it. Should I see if there were questions in the chat? Um, hi, Rachel. Can you hear me? Um, I can't, you can't see me because I'm actually walking on the street and it would make me dizzy, but I didn't want to miss this amazing presentation. Oh, oh. Two comments. My name's Sandra. So two hi. comments. One was recently I was in a Judaica store because you can't pass them by right before Pesach without running in. And oh, one God. of their Pesach plates, talk about evolution, was totally white. White. white, white, white porcelain, no oh, divisions, oh. no nothing. And so I asked the store owner, are there little tiny little plates or bowls? And he said, yes, yes, there are. And I figured maybe there'll be little baits on each of these little plates. There weren't. So I thought that was amazing because it's like the emperor's new clothes. We were expected to see the words of what it represented in our heads. We didn't, we had, quote unquote, evolved to the point where we didn't have to see that. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, if Rachel had seen that, she would have put it down. For sure. For right sure. Right side or left side of your of your Venn diagram, you know. So that was number one with the empty plate, which cracked me up. And then the second thing is you had um, you zoomed by you. You rushed by the quote by Wolpert. I would love to see that. Just have a chance to take a picture of it and then think about it on my own. Could you? perhaps go back and show it on the screen that it was a sort of two inch quote by Wolpert. And then you went to the next um, drawing right away. Sure. The quote um, was in my notes on the side. The text was a, a blurb from Batsalo defining their mission statement. And that's oh, what I, I thought over. it was. Uh, uh -huh. oh. And I read a quote by, by Wolpert and I did those oh. right next to each other. So, but I could share that. I could send that to Rabbi Kelman. It didn't put that on the source sheet. Um, but I absolutely can um, okay. pass it along. All right. Well, thank you very much. It was marvelous. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that white Seder plate. I wish I, I know. Isn't because... that a riot? A yeah. White Seder and plate. Mm -hmm. and I, I'm, I'm from an Ashkenazi background, and that's mm -hmm. really been kind of my Jewish visual exposure for most of my life. And um, really studying Judaica, especially in Israel, you know, where all the Jews have come. Uh, stepping outside of my own experience and seeing uh, Sephardi and Yemenite Seder plates really for the first time. Mm -hmm. 
again, because the Seder is so personal that mm -hmm. I don't have Sephardi or Yemenite um, mm -hmm. heritage. So I don't have those Seder oh, plates in I my tell vocabulary. You Yep. But they also don't have those delineated spaces. So okay. this Absolutely. white one that you saw, I, mm -hmm. I love the kind of blank slate of it mm -hmm. and the futuristicness of that. I wish I could see it. If I see um, it again, I will take a picture. Please, and yes, yes, um, yes, yes. I will say my mother was Syrian mm -hmm. and, my, and my father was Ashkenaz. And so I have this amazing mix of both. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I can't take a picture of because I haven't set the table yet, but... Um, the Sephardic stator plates almost always have handles because they're treated as trays. And mm -hmm. so when you do the part where you take the matzah away or you take the simanim away, um, in the, at the Sephardic table, it was actually to stimulate the question. You actually picked up, you picked up the tray and you took it away unless they put it on the sideboard or wherever you put it in the kitchen, whatever, whatever was not on the table and almost always we used to crack up it's like who set this up for you but almost always somebody either a grown-up or a child would say hey why'd you take that away bring it back and then you have to all laugh and clap and say okay you're yote you're done you asked the question already Beautiful. and then you stimulated the the rest of the of the Haggadah so but that but so if you're interested in the Sephardic ones at least mine the one that's now 78 80 years old that I use was my mother's and her mother's before her and it has handles and I've seen and I've seen a number of them that do have handles to simulate the tray amazing the artist is incorporating the experience into their design and the that is is I never beautiful. thought of it in those words and that's why you're you that's exactly right I need to see this I know, <laughs> I know, I know. You would look out. it is so beautiful it's verdigris it's greenish and brass and it's go. It's great. It's great. It's great. And we use it and move it, move it with the handles. And someone always says something about it. it. It's pretty amazing. But just if you can visualize it and it's bigger than a regular state of plate, it's a little tray like. There needs to be a, a follow up exchange with. Yeah, we definitely. OK, <laughs> yeah. I'll get if if Rabbi Kelman's put posts your um your email, I could actually literally in five minutes set when I when I take the Kara out. I'll click a picture and send it to you in an email. Thank you. And I'll send you the Walpert text. Wonderful. Thank you and very the archive much. It came from. Yeah. Okay. Okay. This was super. Thank you. You can send us any email. We'll happy to. to Hi, know. Rabbi Kelman. Yep. Look at that. You're a shadchan. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said you're a matchmaker. Oh, I'm well. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's really, it as, great. Um, as Rachel mentions, Gabe Goldstein, who is. Um, Grew up in Toronto. It's work. I, I see still working the YU. Um, I'm not sure where he's working, but he's in. Yeah, he's at right. the museum. He's the, he the, museum, the director, yeah. the interim director right now. So I had asked him to speak actually, and he recommended that I asked Rachel. So I want to thank you and thank you. For the, I found it fascinating, and believe me, art was not my favorite subject growing up in school. <laughs> um, and uh, really, it's uh, I really found it uh, very fascinating. And thank you very much. And um, okay, have a wonderful Pesach. Enjoy your time in California. Share good things in Israel. And we look forward to having you um, join us again in the in the future. Uh, tomorrow, one o'clock, Ariel Kelman, who I know very well, uh, like Rachel, I'm just meeting for the first time. We'll give a share tomorrow, one p.m. on hardening Paro's heart. Thursday, Athena Blaustein will talk on the Haftorot. Of 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 um of Shabbos Sagadol of Torah of Shabbos Sagadol and Friday morning my my shear and the sitter that they give at nine fifteen will switch to the Hakada for this week so um look forward to learning with you Rabbi Liptag will be speaking eleven fifteen on Sunday morning his regular time slot also on Pesach of course okay and we'll have our regular parsha shear on, on Thursday night so look forward to learning with you everybody be well. Uh, and have a great day. It's still uh, it's still early in the morning. And uh, where are you, LA? Are you, are you in LA? I'm in LA. Yeah, yeah. I have to go take my kids to get a slushy now. <laughs> They've been very. There patient. you go. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Be Thank well, you, Rabbi Kalman. This bye -bye. is lovely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Yeah.